non-parametric methodology should have been used to analyze this data. This is one of the most common and ubiquitous concerns of peer reviewers and a source of frustration for many researchers. This can lead to researchers mad dash to reanalyze their data at the last minute or in the worst case scenario can really negate the entire purpose of our studies. My name is Jeffrey Franck. I'm a statistician and the CEO of STAT59. In this video, we're going to talk about non-parametric studies, how to use them, and how three simple non-parametric tests can serve almost all your needs for non-parametric methodology. First of all, why use non-parametric studies? I'm going to talk a little bit about the indications. Why would we want to use non-parametric studies? Well, non-parametric studies are used when two conditions are present. There is a small sample and their sample size, and the sample is also non-normal. What does this mean exactly? Well, the vast majority of study tests that we do, things like the t-test or ANOVA, these all assume that the sampling distribution is normal, shaped like the normal or Gaussian curve. Now you can get this in two circumstances. One is when we have big sample sizes. When we have big sample sizes, by nature, something called the central limit theorem allows us to use parametric type studies because we know even if the background data has any type of distribution, the sampling distribution will tend to be normal. The other time we can use this is when the sampling distribution of the original data is actually normal. So for instance, if we were using a small sample of people's height, we will be able to use the usual parametric studies since we know that the sampling of patient's height or people's height is of a normal distribution. So when should we use these? Well, remember that if the sample size is greater than 30, we can use the central limit theory to use our normal tests, the t-test ANOVA. If, however, the sample size is small, we may want to consider non-parametric studies. We can lose some efficacy if the wrong test is used, so you may want to consult a statistician at any time to find out whether we should use non-parametric testing. And when in doubt, it's best to just use non-parametric testing. So remember, look out in your study. Are you in the case where you have a small sample size and the sample is of a population that is not known to be normal, then we should consider non-parametric studies. So I want to just, after these indications, talk a little bit about an example. And we're going to use a simple example in this video to talk about the use of non-parametric studies. So in this example, our researcher is setting up a cybersecurity training course. So in this case, what we have is we have a researcher who is devised a training course for cyber terrorism response. And she has a maximum of 18 participants. And she wants to know, does this course make the participants feel prepared. The way she's going to score this is using some Likert data. So at the end of the course, she will present this statement. I am confident that I could use the department's IT emergency procedures in the event of a cybersecurity attack and ask the participants to rate it from strongly disagree, which she is going to score with the number one, to strongly agree which she will score with the number five. So here we run already into some analysis problems. First of all, a single Likert response item is not guaranteed to be normally distributed. We don't know, perhaps everyone will answer five, perhaps everyone will answer one. And here we see that her sample size is small. We have only 18 participants, so which is under the limit of 30. So this is a classic example of where we sh probably should use some non-parametric studies. So what are her options? Well, she could add a number of Likert questions together to make a scale. Well, we do know that for Likert data, if you add 15 questions 
and they all tend to point to the same answer. They can become normally distributed. We could change to a linear numeric scale. This is another type of scale that we know is, is usually normal. We can increase the sample size. So we know that in sample sizes greater than 30, the sampling of even Likert data will continue to be normal based on the central limit theorem, or she may elect to use non-parametric testing. So in this case, our researcher is convinced that her cybersecurity training course will work, and she wants to go ahead and use her single Likert scale response. So here we are, this is why. Why should she use non-parametric studies? Small sample size, non-normal. Now I'm gonna show you that three tests can really encompass almost all the scenarios when you might wanna use non-parametric studies. And what are these three tests? They're the Wilcoxon Sand Rank Test, the Wilcoxon Rank Sum Test, also called the Man Whitney Test, and the Kruskal Wallace Test. And I'm gonna show you that Choosing these can be actually pretty easy, and it's based on your study design. Let's talk first about the Wilcox and Sine rank test. And I'm gonna talk about the hypothesis test, and very, very important is the use of the paired test. So let's talk a little bit about the Wilcox and Sine rank test. So many of you have already probably been thinking that there's a number of ways that our researcher could run her course. So one way would be for the researcher here to have the 18 participants complete the training course and following the course have each of the participants complete this single one question survey. Maybe in this case her hypothesis is the true average will be four out of five on her Likert scale. So here she's going to ask again this one question. I am confident that I could use the department's IT emergency procedures in the event of a cybersecurity attack. She's gonna have the participants rate this from one to five, and her hypothesis is that the average response will be four. Here's some sample data. So let's take a look here. Here we have the data from 18 participants, and we can see that we rated them. They have rated their, their Likert scale from one to five. Taking a quick look, we see, that mo we see a lot of fives and fours. We see a couple ones. So here we can use the Wilcox and Sign rank test. We have 18 values. They don't necessarily, they are not necessarily normally distributed. So let's find their median. It turns out using the Wilcox and Sign rank test, their median is four. We get a p-value of 0 0.88 on our hypothesis, which shows that there is no significant reason to believe that the the average is different from four. And here we can get a confidence interval of three to five. So one of the things that you'll note is that we have a 90% confidence interval. It is with uh, non-parametric studies, sometimes difficult to get the exact confidence interval you want. But here we can be 90% sure that the true average on this Likert scale question is between three and five. So you can see here that we've used the simple Wilcoxon rank sum test, signed rank test, in order to find the mean or the average. In this case, it's actually the median. We to find the average value of a Likert scale. One of the other things we could look at is, can we use a paired test? So perhaps our researcher sets up her study in a different way. Perhaps here, the researcher has nine participants enroll in the study and each participant takes this survey question before and after the course. And in this case, she's going to compare the pre and post-test post value. And her hypothesis is that there will be an increase in the rating after the course. And this is a pretty common way that people will set up educational studies. It's a pre and post-test design. So again, we, she proposes the same question. I am confident that I could use the department's IT emergency procedures in the event of a cybersecurity attack. She has the participants rate this from one to five, and they do the rating once before they take her training course, and the second time after. Let's take a look at some data. So here what we found is we have a small data table. 
We can see the ID of the participants, A through I across the top, that's the nine participants. And we can see in each case, their answer to the single Likert response pre-course and then post-course. If you just take a quick look, you can see, yeah, in most cases, it looks like there was an increase in their confidence after the course. So this is the paired Wilcox sign rank test. This is a, noting that this is paired is an extremely, extremely important part of this test and is a place where sometimes early on, researchers early on in their career can make the mistake. Remember that these are not independent data. Okay, so what we're actually looking for, the, the null hypothesis here is that the difference for each of the nine participants between pre and post test score is zero. That's our null hypothesis. And we want to prove that the null hypothesis is wrong. And here, using the Wilcox and sign rank test, we find that the median change is 1.5. We get a 95% confidence interval of 0, 0.0, very small, to but positive to 2.5 and a p-value of 0 0.049. Now, an interesting part about this data is if you take a look, we do have a significant p-value. Most people would say that the p, a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is significant. So this p-value is indeed significant. We do note, however, that the 95% confidence interval almost contains zero, not quite. So what we can say is, we, we're 95% confident that there is a change for the better, that it's positive, but that, that change for the better might be extremely small, 0 0.00003. So here you saw that the Wilcox and Sign Rank test is a very easy way to look for data that is non-normal and small sample size. And then we can use either the hypothesis test about a single value or we can use the paired test when we need it. We're gonna look now at the Wilcox and Rank Sum Test. Now the Wilcox and Rank Sum Test is also known as the Mann-Whitney Test, and it's one of the, if not the most commonly used non-parametric study. So another way that our researcher could have set up her educational study is in this way. Perhaps the researcher divides the participants into two groups. She randomly assigns them. The control group will be asked the one question survey and the experimental group will get the course and then answer the survey. And her hypothesis is that the rating will be higher in the experimental group. So again, this is a very common way that people will do educational studies. So this is a, pre uh, a group that has an intervention and a group that does not have the intervention. And we have really the post-test scoring only. So look at her data here. So in her control group, we see that there was nine participants and they rated on the same question. Are you confident that you'll be able to use the department's IT security protocols? And they rated them from one to five. So here we see a one, a two, a three, and some five, a five. And then we see those who took the course. And we see that there's, from the outset, look a little bit higher. So different from our paired group, these are not, these are not 18 different people, nine of which were in the control group and nine of which were in the course group. So what does she do? Well, she does her analysis using the Wilcox and Rank Sum Test and she finds that the median change, the median difference or effect is 1.0 with a p-value of 0.08 and a confidence interval of minus this very small number to two, okay? So here we see that we have a p-value that's sort of just below our level of significance, and we can see a confidence interval that includes zero. So inside our confidence interval is the null hypothesis that there's no difference. So in this case, we failed to prove that there is a difference between these two groups. So here we saw the Wilcox and Rank Sum Test, or the Mann-Whitney Test, is used when we have two groups of data and not the same people in each group. Finally, we're going to talk about the Kruskal-Wallis test. Now, the Kruskal-Wallis test is another method, and it's probably our third most popular non-parametric method. A final way or different way that the researcher might have done her study is this. 
The, here the researcher wants to divide the participants into three groups. There's a control group. Okay, the control group gets no intervention. They just complete this one question survey. There's a course group that completes the course and then the survey. And there's a third group, the course plus simulation group. And they complete the course and, and a simulation exercise and then do a survey. And her hypothesis is the course plus simulation group will be the most confident. And she wants to know, is there a difference between these three groups? So again, this is a pretty common design for educational studies, except here we have three groups. So we can see that our previous tests, the rank sum test and the Man whitney test, they simply will not work. So here we have our data and our data table looks a little bit different here. So here we have six participants in each of three groups, the control group, and we see their ratings, course group, we see their ratings and the course plus simulation group. And again, these are their ratings on the single Likert question of how I am confident that I would be able to use the department's IT security. Now here we get a p-value of 0 0.008. Now the Kruskal-Wallis test is a little bit different. It functions very, very similar to how we would use the ANOVA test for parametric data. And we get a p-value. This p, small p-value says, yes, there are some difference between the groups. It says that B, which group that you're in does have an effect on your, the, your median score on the Likert data. It does not, however, tell you which group is the best. So our researcher will have to do work through some other tests to find out which is the best. Often this involves just plotting them. We could plot these on something like a box plot and take a look at where it see where the difference is. But our Kruskal-Wallis test, very similar to the ANOVA for standard data, shows that there is a difference between the three groups. So we can hear, see here that the Kruskal-Wallis test has allowed us to look at the difference between three different groups. And that's our three tests. But for, for the most part, most researchers will be able to use either the Wilcox and Sign Rank test, the Wilcox and Rank Sum test, or the Kruskal Wallace test. And that should take care of almost all your non parametric needs. So, how do you put this all together? Well, in this video, we saw that using non parametric tests really involves three separate tests. First step. Do I really need a non-parametric test? And looking at that to decide. The second, the second question is choosing the right test for the study. And we saw that in this video, really nailing down that study hypothesis is the way that you decide which of those three tests to use. And finally, learning how to interpret the p-value and confidence interval for the non-parametric tests. My name is Jeffrey Frank. I'm a statistician and the CEO of STAT59. If you would like to see how the STAT59 web app can help you quickly design, analyze, and report your own research study, please join us at our website at www.stat59.com.